podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to AI Scouted on Anfield Index Pro. I'm Dave Hendrick, joined as always by Mr. Carl Matchett. How are you, sir? Tired. I'm actually quite annoyed with my friends who have been on a tea ban for 48 hours. <laughs> Is this a real thing? Yeah, it's a real thing. He was he was spending too long doing a few things uh, on, on you know social media and I told him to cut it down and he said, fine, but then you have to cut down your tea intake. So here we are. That must be the toughest thing you've ever undertaken in your life. It's actually the second toughest thing, because the first toughest was to not immediately decapitate him. That's fair. That's fair. And, like, this is coming from a man who was in Sheffield last night, so he's seen hardship. Carl Matchett has been through some wars. Um, so let's start there. You were at the game last night, uh, Liverpool 2, Sheffield United 0. Um, I thought a fairly straightforward win. They had some moments. They only had one shot on target in the game. I thought we were comfortably the better team and fully deserving of our 2-0 win, but what say you? Um, I mean, yes, all of those things I think are correct. I would say that I think we were a bit sloppy and too lax with the lead that we had. Um, I know we got the second goal, but I can guarantee there were thousands of Liverpool fans out there just thinking this has got one in the 88th minute written all over it because we were I, I thought we were really sloppy in possession especially first half um, I would two or three really really good performers and thankfully Virgil van Dijk was one of them because when he's really good we don't tend to concede many chances or many goals um, Sheffield you know, rubbish absolute rubbish they did nothing um, even like off the ball work is not particularly good they're very reactive there's a lot of work there for Wilder to do to get them um, anywhere near uh, let's say challenging the other bottom three to get out of the bottom three. Um, but yeah, we were we were very, very comfortable. I think, you know, had they have equalised, let's say, before the 80th minute mark or something, there were obviously quite a few gears for us to go through uh, that we could have stepped up. I think 2-0 of, of the scoreline was absolutely fine on the balance of chances and very definitely on the balance of possession. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it was our best performance by a long shot. It didn't ultimately need to be. I'm just glad that we didn't, you know, pay the price for a bit of uh, overly sloppy. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, so we're now two points off top. We play Crystal Palace early on Saturday. And if we win that, we go top. Arsenal have to go to Aston Villa on Saturday evening. And then they would need to win to go back above us. Now, Arsenal struggled to beat uh, Luton last night uh, on Tuesday night. And last night we saw Aston Villa, and I don't know how much of this you've seen, but Aston Villa, Carol, put in one of the best performances I've seen in the last couple of seasons. The scoreline of 1-0 doesn't reflect the game. They should have beaten City by three last night. I, it's, I, I've rarely seen a Pep Guardiola side demolished like that, and they were demolished. That is one of the worst games in Pep Guardiola's managerial career in terms of shots allowed, shots of your own, corners, everything. Every measurable attacking stat, Villa absolutely wiped the floor with them. And I I, I I think they'll beat Arsenal at the weekend as well. Um, I mean, at home, Villa, excellent, as as we've been over already. Like, we did a little bit of exploration into this too, you know, for part of match four actually last night. Like, home form needs to be nearly perfect for, for anybody who wants basically top four, but certainly to be in the title fight. 
We already know that. So it's really the away form where things are decided. Between the top four right now, um, four points have been dropped at home all season. And we're like talking like 90 plus points available there now. So your home form is just immaculate or you're not in the conversation. That's it. And it is going to be on the road where things are decided this year. Mm. Um, by that token, yeah, Aston Villa could definitely do damage against Arsenal. They, they, they were already really good at home. They've really come on another level this season. Since in last night's game yet. Um, obviously, I was, I was travelling for, for most of it. So uh, I will watch that back and see exactly what they did to limit City as much as um, go at them themselves. Because that's the really sort of interesting thing I think uh, I read a couple of stats like City didn't have a shot after the 14th minute or was it shot on target or something like that mm. um, so yeah I mean excellent excellent performance you beat Man City anyhow but if you're clearly the better side that's uh, that's a big thing uh, I have to say I'm a little bit wondering whether Pep pried a bit of a mind game on his players and it backfired because obviously there were three draws in a row it's not often they go three games without a win in the league now it's four which I don't think has happened since he came to England. Um and he said before the match, you know, if we if we play the way we are, we're gonna win the league. And that's probably the first time you know just Pep, maybe like any manager at all that I've heard say we're winning the league this early on in the season. Like usually it's like oh, it's such a hard league and there are loads of teams who can win it and yeah we're capable. But no, he actually came out and said if we play like this, we'll win the league. We're winning the league this season again. And whether that has anything to do with it or not, I don't know, obviously, but I just think it's interesting that that's really not something you hear too often and it's immediately followed by what sounds like a poor performance and uh, obviously a damaging result. Yeah, two shots in the entire game. Not not two on target, two shots total. Uh, both for Erling Haaland, both within 10 seconds of each other and both saved by Emmy Martinez. No other shots for the rest of the game and no corners for the entirety of the game, whereas Aston Villa, they were quite rampant. They had 22 shots. They had seven on target. Ederson made a couple of great saves. They hit the post. They missed a couple of big chances that they should have taken. Uh, And, you know, City will say, oh, well, the goal was a deflected shot, but that's just hiding behind an excuse. They got walloped. This wasn't like the game against Arsenal, which was fairly even. And Arsenal scored a late goal, a late fluke. This was this was dominance. Um, it's the second time, I believe, in his Premier League career where City have gone four games without a win. Uh, in 16-17, his first season, they had yeah, three draws and a defeat. Now, like then, like now, they've played largely good teams in that run. So that in that run, they drew nil-nil at home with Stoke. You can only imagine how many men Stoke had behind the ball. They drew 1-1 at home with Liverpool, 2-2 away to Arsenal, and then they lost 2-1 away to Chelsea, who obviously went on and won the league that year. In this run, obviously defeat to Aston Villa last night. Before that draw with Tottenham, before that draw with us, before that draw with Chelsea. So Chelsea playing the role of Stoke as that sort of nasty mid-table team that nobody wants much to do with uh, in this run. Well, yeah, it doesn't happen often. And I believe it's the first time in his managerial career that his team haven't had a corner kick in a game. Um, I I, I just, I'm, I'm actually so impressed with Villa this season. And that midfield pairing, Carl, of Bubakar Kamara and Douglas Louise, they're just, they're outstanding. They fit so well together. And when you consider that those two cost them a combined 15 million, and you can throw John McGinn into it, who cost, I think, two and a half, that's really impressive. Yuri Tielemans, they got in on a free. Like last night, Jacob Ramsey and Moussa Diaby, who I would argue are two of their five best players, along with the two boys in centre midfield and Ollie Watkins, those two came off the bench. They didn't even start. So it wasn't like Villa were even at full tilt. They were 
bringing two of the best players off the bench. I think there's more to come from this team. What would it take? Like, what would Unai Emery have to do to really impress you this season? If he gets top four, would that would you view that as very impressive? Considering, you know, he hasn't spent huge amounts of money with this Villa team. Would that be one of the better achievements in his career if he was to get top four with them this year? Um, I, I don't think it would be as good as maybe the first year with Sevilla, but probably fairly close to that, I suppose. Um, I don't think anything he achieved with PSG is, is noteworthy, to be honest. Um, same with Arsenal. Nothing at Villarreal. Yeah, so maybe the back-to-back Europas, um, let's say, would be, uh, if you combine them, would be higher than that. But also, I think it depends on the manner. Of it. Like if Spurs, let's say, recapture form or get players back or whatever, mm. then, then, yeah, that's a fourth really good side that they have to see off, or Newcastle, obviously. Yeah. But it does seem like a three-way of... battle between those three, doesn't it, for that fourth spot? Yeah, I think so. I mean, United are obviously ahead of Newcastle at the minute, but I until we see something more consistent from them. I think it's really difficult to say that they are, you know, top four challengers, to be honest. Um, I do think that they're below the level at least. Well, no, I think they're below the level of all three of those clubs, to be perfectly honest. But if they keep getting the result, it doesn't matter. You know, that's where they are. So I think if Villa get it on their own merit, let's say, rather than Spurs just running out of steam or Newcastle sort of going in on Europe or whatever, like I'd be looking for we spoke about it only a couple of weeks ago. The away record is the thing. Like if they get 10 wins away from home this season and finish fifth, I would say that's exceptional improvement. Like really, really unbelievable improvement. You know, we're assuming the home form continue very, very good, even if it's not perfect all the way through the season. But that would be massive progression. Really, mm. really impressive, I think. Well, so far they've won three games away from home. They've beaten Burnley, they've beaten Chelsea, and they've beaten Spurs. Now, it, it was a Spurs team missing a lot of players, but they still went there and got the win. They have three defeats away from home, hammered by Newcastle, hammered by us, and they lost away to Aston Villa. And then they've drawn at Wolves and at Bournemouth. So you'd look at the defeat to um, to Forest and maybe the Bournemouth game as bad results. Because Wolves, they beat City at home and they gave us absolute horrors at their place and losing to Liverpool and losing to Newcastle aren't bad results the the scoreline looks bad but you know they're two of the better teams in the league so if you lose to them you lose to them but their home form has been incredible seven wins from seven they're right at the top of the home form list with us and I, I do think when when we look at you know, their upcoming games, they play Arsenal, but then they go Brentford away, Sheffield United home, Manchester United away, Burnley home, Everton away. Like they could get to the end of January. They play Villa, I'm sorry, they play Newcastle at the end of January and then Sheffield United at the start of February. Like they could well get into February in a in a strong top four position. And if, you know, if Spurs don't recapture the early season form, if Newcastle have a wobble like they did earlier in the year, then they could open a gap. And like, I don't, I just looking at some, some of the Villa fans I follow last night, they don't even think fourth is the cap on this, this, this team right now. They're aiming higher. Now, none of them are suggesting they can win the league. They're being realistic, but they are saying, why can't we get second or third here? Because none of the top three, well, the, the, the deemed to be top three, none of them are perfect. Arsenal have flaws, Liverpool have flaws, City have flaws. Yeah. But and this... if they beat Arsenal, they're one point behind them. I, I understand that. But also, inherently, when people discuss their teams and doing better and all that, they just overlook the fact that, one, their team, their players have never done this across nine and ten months. They just mm. haven't and can't just suddenly do it once all and other than once in an absolute blue moon when absolutely everything else goes right for you. Even Leicester can do that, right? Leicester won the league with a ridiculously low tally of points. Yeah. That that would have been maybe top four for them another season sort of thing. So 
it's it's all well and good saying oh, you know third second place whatever we're, we're capable yeah you are across a game or across 20 games but what about across 60 games because you're also in Europe and you also think you're going to have a decent cup run domestically you yeah. can't do all of these things just magically in the first campaign if they get in the top four regardless of how that's affected you know even if you know, Newcastle focus on Europa League or something like that you know that's fine. Just just take it for what it is, and that's yeah. your that's your progress. But if, if they get fourth and, means... and win the Conference League, that is an amazing season. Ah, oh, that's that's their best season in decades. Yeah, since the year they won the European Cup, that's their best season because they'll have won. I know it's not a, a massively prestigious trophy right now, but in twenty five years, it will be. You know, because it's it's just new. That's why it doesn't have any history for now. But in 25 years, it'll have some history and it will be seen as a bit more prestigious. And uh, like, I think on balance, you look at their team, they've got a really good goalkeeper. Their defence looks very, very strong when it's Konza at right back, Carlos and Torres in the middle, and either Dina or Moreno at left back. That's, that's a strong unit. The double pivot in midfield are great. They've got really good options in the wide areas from Ramsey to Diaby to McGinn to Zaniolo to Leon Bailey. Um, You've got Yuri Thielemans can play in midfield or he can play off the striker. Diaby can play off the striker. Ramsey can play off the striker. Bailey can play off the striker. And Ollie Watkins is playing out of his skin this season. If an injury to him comes, that will obviously shoot like torpedo a lot of things, but they have a Jan Duran who looks a really promising option there too. And I think they'll go and spend in January. Now, are you that person who has everything, the coolest merch and those must have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection from our popular range of bespoke design, t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies, and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy, by searching for Anfield Index. Carl, as I watch them play, I can't help but look at Bubakar Kamara and think he is the one for us. He's the one that we should be going all in on for that holding midfield role. I think he has absolutely everything that we're looking for in that position. He's the right age. I think he's already the second best in that position in the league after Rodri. He's got levels to go up in terms of the potential for development. He's versatile enough. He can play all across the back line. He's a natural leader. He's good on the ball. He doesn't need to make eight tackles a game because he reads the game so well and he's clever. I I don't think it's a doable deal in January unless you absolutely blow the doors off them with a silly offer. So my question to you is, would you forgo a defensive midfielder in January to wait for him in the summer? Or is there someone else out there like a Jao Polinia, a Mats Viefer? Would would you go for one of them who's not as good, but we can get in the shorter term? No. No, I wouldn't. Um I honestly I don't have a I don't have one single soul defensive mid who I absolutely want above everybody else at this point. I see, see quite a lot of players who could fix a range of things, but not everything. You know, there's a there's a a wide variety of of holding players who we could get to to do a variety of jobs. And some of them they're really, really good at and some of them they just have to sort of learn on the job as such in the way that we do them. I don't think that there's anyone out there who I say, you're the one we need, we absolutely need. So I don't think that we're going to get one in December. Uh, sorry, in January anyway. I wasn't assuming that we were going to get one in January either, um, especially while we still sort out exactly 
how often we want to use Trent in midfield um, and all the rest of it. And it may well be that the more we want that or, or just the, the more injuries or absences in other ways that we pick up, is it may be a fullback that we need again still uh, much more than a defensive midfielder because it wasn't this season that we thought we were going to be back to winning the title. But if you get to January and you're, let's say, two points clear, do you suddenly change your mind there? That's obviously the other side of that equation. Well, see, that's the thing. Like, I didn't think we would be in as good a position as we're in now, but you you look at how the fixtures are breaking for us, and I think there's a very good possibility that we play Newcastle on January 1st, and after that game, we're maybe four points clear with that that then break to come in the Premier League. And if you're in that position, I think you have to capitalise on it. And the biggest need in this team is a defensive midfielder. Like, I know we need that left-sided defender as well, but let's be really honest about this. Jurgen Klopp is going to stick with Andy Robertson when he comes back because it's Jurgen Klopp and that's what he does. He sticks with players long past the point he should. He did it with Henderson. He did it with Milner. He's done it with others at Liverpool, including Fabinho, and at other clubs, including Dortmund, when we saw what happened in their last season as players he should have moved on broke down. He did it at Mines when players he should have moved on broke down. I think if we're in that position come January 2nd, where we're four points clear, even if we're two points behind, I think we've got to go for the title. Like, we've got to make moves to go for the title, even if it's a case of bringing forward moves that we had for the summer. I think we have to do it. Now, there are other needs. That left-sided defender is one, but again, I I just have a hard time imagining that he's going to bring someone in and all of a sudden Andy Robertson is going to be confined to the bench for the rest of the season, you know, other than, you know, the odd game here or there. What I do think is definitely needed is a right-sided centre-back because Ibu is, inju- is injury-prone. Joe Gomez is both injury-prone and needed as a fullback, And we've just lost Joel Matip for the season. And that's probably the end of Joel Matip's Liverpool career, unless the club decide to give him a one-year extension to help him through his rehab and get him back up to speed so that in the summer of 2025 he could go and get a good deal because it'll be hard for him to get a good deal while he's got a torn ACL and is three months away from coming back. Because we know how he takes like a, an extra long period of time to recover from injuries. It took him six months to come back from an ankle injury, like a, a torn ligament in his ankle. A torn ACL, I, I think it's going to take him nine, ten months before he's back on the pitch. So I do think we absolutely need to explore that right side centre back market now. I think it was something that we were going to need to do in the summer that needs to come forward. We will now have a second non homegrown spot that opens up. We have one as things stand with Joel out. We won't register him for the back end of the back half of the season. So now we have two. So we can go and chase two players. They don't have to be homegrown or 21 and under or anything like that. They can be two ready-made players to go into that team. If you're looking around at centre-backs, is there anyone that's caught your eye that you've looked at and thought, he'd be a really nice fit into this shape? Because we know what they have to be. They have to be enormous. They have to be quick. They have to be dominant in the air, and they have to be good 1v1. And ideally in this shape, they've got to be comfortable enough going out and defending it right back the way Ibu has to. So is the, who 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 would you be looking at to come in and fill that role? I think Virgil van Dijk's been pretty good this season. He's the one who's caught my eye the most, to be honest. <laughs> He's not bad that far, is he? You missed you missed a brilliant yeah, thing last right. night. Did you, you see? You, you obviously saw that phenomenal bit of defending against Cameron Archer in the first half. Yeah. Well, we had the joy of Ethan Koku on commentary, oh. and that well-known um, doyon of information, Ethan Koku who decided that having obviously played as a you know decent striker in the Premier League many, many years ago, that he was best positioned to advise Virgil van Dijk on how to defend and to criticise him for his lazy approach in that instance. Hello, 
I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a tad predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa, he does Anfield Index. He presents a tad predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL roundtable there every week after the Premier League match week. So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, for, for, for dealing with the danger? Yes, for dealing with it perfectly. He'd, yeah. He said, this is typical Van Dyke. He's quite lazy in coming across. He likes to hold the middle. And if he doesn't get beat, he thinks he's done his job. But he hasn't done his job there, except that he had done it and he'd done it brilliantly. But anyway, other than Virgil, what centre-backs <laughs> are out there that you would be looking at? Um, I think first port of call, we've actually spoken about it before. Um, if one of the, the Barcelona pair could be lured away, who are very, very good, both on the right and on the centre, I would first and foremost be looking at that. I think out of the two, maybe now Koundé fits the bill best, simply because if we move Trent, he can be the permanent right back, whereas I don't mm. think Araujo as a permanent right back is quite as good an option. Um, but they would probably be my top two immediate considerations if we just want to go go out there and buy as close to elite as possible. Yeah. Ronald Araujo is, is, is definitely one that I, I very much like. And I actually, I know it's not ideal, but I think he could adapt to it. I'd love to see what he'd look like as a permanent right back. As that sort of Ivanovic type of right back, but with more recovery pace, better 1v1. I would be interested, but Kunde would be great either. And obviously they've got serious financial issues. And at the moment, they are getting both of them in the team. Um, but that might not stay the same. A couple of others, uh, Diamande at Sporting Lisbon. Now he has, I believe, an 80 million euro buyout, which is very, very high. But he is an enormous talent. He is 20 and... I think the ceiling on him is sky high. I think I think I'd have to take a very strong look at Jean Claire Tadebo, Carl, who's been absolutely incredible this season for Nice. Physically he fits the bill, stylistically he fits the bill. He'll be more than comfortable defending big spaces. Like Nice of the an best. Aerial monster. He's not an aerial monster, but but I think he can be like, I think he can because he has the aggression. I think he just needs to be coached. He's never been well coached ever. And I look at that Nice defense, which is the best in Europe this season. And I don't understand how it's the best in Europe, other than the fact that he has been otherworldly good. Like if I was picking my, all Europe team the season so far. Him and Virgil are the centre backs. He is carrying the corpse of Dante, who was washed oh, five dear. years ago. Dante. Yeah. Five years ago he was washed. And yet Tadebo is performing at such a level that Dante is playing almost in this Zen like state where he walks three yards in each direction just to do his work and Tadebo's doing everything else. Like it's not like they've got great fullbacks. The goalkeeper's not a world beater. The midfield is pretty strong, credit to them, but he has been sensational. And I know there's been, you know, he's had a, a strange path to where he is now. Joined Barca far too young. He he's admitted his attitude wasn't right there. He thought getting that move meant he'd made it. And he got a rude awakening. Goes out on, on a couple of loans. Obviously, the Schalke thing was a disaster. But he lands at Nice. And he, he just has gone from strength to strength. And he's still young. 
which is what what entices me. Like, I think you look at him, and potentially you could be thinking, right, short term, him and Ibu are rotating, but maybe long term, him and Ibu is the pair. He's twenty four in a couple of weeks, so his best years are still well ahead of him. Which are you having on the left out of the two? Ibu. I would play. I'd, I'd be shifting Ibu across. If Virgil needs a rest, I'd move Ibu across. I think Ibu is comfortable left side. We've seen him play left side when he plays at Matip, and I think he's really comfortable there. Whereas with Tadebo, I do think he's only he can play left side, but I think he's so much better right side because he's so right foot dominant that I I think he's just it's safer to keep him that side. Someone we looked at previously for actually a bit of a similar role, even if it's not tactical role the same. Um, Balerdi, you know what I must say? Yeah, I mean, I. Marseille are obviously not particularly good this season, but he's another one that's had like a weird kind of career to date where he came to Europe far too early to Dortmund. It it just didn't work for him. But since he's gone to Marseille, I, I do think he's been impressive. Um, And in a, in a bad, not a bad team, but in a mediocre team, he's, he's having a fairly strong season. He could definitely play that role because he's guy asks for Tamora. The Kyle Tamora is not a bad shout. He has the physicality. He has the speed. Again, he's not someone I see as a a massive aerial presence, though. No, no. He'd be, I mean, for Kyle Tamora, he's, what was he, 6'1". He'd be interesting. I mean, you could look, he'd be expensive, but you could maybe look at Mark Wehi. Again, he's not an aerial monster, but he is a very, very good defender. And he is one that I think could play as a right back. If you wanted that defensive Ivanovic type of right back, I think Mark Wehi could play that role. Um, He'd be so expensive. I, I, I can't imagine Palace would take would take less than sixty million for him. Um, guys asking about Zerbani, he he made one brilliant recovery challenge last night. It was absolutely outstanding. It's too early for him though. Uh, he needs at least another, I'd say, another eighteen months at Bournemouth before he'll be ready to step up. But there are like there are good young centre back options out there. Um, Lenny Yarrow, we've talked about him before. I, I'd be very much in favour of maybe exploring that. He has the size, he has the speed, he's good enough on the ball. He's one I, I look at and I think like on my short list of potential long-term Virgil successors, he is one that I think could could fit the bill there. Um, And again, he's not playing for a team that are brilliant. And Lille might be open to a sale considering they do have uh, some financial issues. Now, the issue with Lenny Yarrow is that for right now, he's quite weak in the air. But I do think once he gets older, gets bigger, gets stronger, I think that is something he can work on. At the moment, he's winning 62%, which isn't bad, but it's on a low volume. And maybe the most important part is... Um, how close do you think Kanate is to being fully ready? Because we've seen him be amazing and we've seen him put in like a month at a time of pretty low par performances. But we might now be looking at needing him for maybe five months of really good cool- Yeah, which, which he did in 21-22, but he did it in rotation with Joel. So I think the bigger question, Carl, is is Joe Gomez ready? Because it has to, if 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 it's if it's going to be Ebu, he's going to need breaks. 
And Joe Gomez is the one that's going to have to come in unless we buy somebody. And Joe, Joe's been pretty good this year. Now, he was dreadful last night. But he has been hit and miss for the last couple of years. And there are concentration lapses. Ibu worries me injury-wise. I, I don't think Ibu's kicked on massively since we bought him. I think he's improved a little bit on the ball. Defensively, I think he's still the same player, which is very, very good, to be clear. Like, he's a top six or seven defense, centre-back in the league. But I was, after his first season, I thought in a couple of years, it's going to be Virgil and Ibu levels above the rest of the league. Injuries have played a big factor. I don't think some of the rotation has helped him either, where he's been in the cup rotation and partnering, with, with respect, partnering Kwanzaa, where he has to be the senior defender and the organiser in that. I don't think that suits him. I think he's better when someone's talking him through games. I think he looks a lot better with next to Virgil. But he's also... Do you remember when Sacco used to come back into the team and he'd always have like one or two rotters and then he'd settle in and be good? Ibu has a little bit of, he comes into the team, he'll have a shaky game. It might not be the first game, it could be the second or third, but he has to play through that and stay in the team. The issue has been he hasn't been able to stay in the team because he's getting the injuries and because Jurgen's been trying to rotate them to keep them all healthy. I, I I don't know. I I do worry a little bit about the centre back situation. Like, I think Ebu is great, but and you you can't really rely on him for as many games as you as as you need. You can't rely on Joe Gomez, and now we've lost Matip, who again was one that you weren't overly reliant on because he was terrible last season. He was poor at the end of the previous season. He's injury prone. Like for me, this is something that should have been addressed a couple of years ago. We needed a centre back. I'd say two years ago, someone should have been brought in along with Ibu. It wasn't just Ibu that we needed. We needed another one, and we haven't done it. And I, I, I don't know. I, I, the Gomez part of it worries me more than the Ibu part of it, though. To give you a roundabout answer, I mean, we're going to get the start of the answer over the next what four games because obviously you. Is a, a non event now, so we can imagine that. I presume that would be Kwanzaa and Gomez together with probably Bradley and Scanlon or Brian. Um, oh, Chambers. I completely forgot his name at left back. Sorry? Luke, Luke Chambers. Yes, thank you. Luke Chambers at left back um, for that one. And then after Man United and before Arsenal, it's a League Cup match against West Ham. So you know, do you attempt to go strong even if there is a little bit of rotation and play uh, almost the same defence in all three matches, United, West Ham and Arsenal? Or do you try to change one or two of them for that midweek game against uh, West Ham? Because obviously it's not the biggest priority, but it is very close now to uh, being there for a trophy. If you beat West Ham, it's not looking tremendously difficult at this point, given the form of the other clubs involved. No, no, it's not at all. Um, I'm, I'm That West Ham one is an interesting one, purely, like, if it wasn't Arsenal after it, I, I'd be adamant yeah. to go full strength. It wouldn't surprise me if Jürgen goes full strength anyway. Yeah. Which he's done before, you know. Um because it's Burnley after that, so maybe you, you rotate players at Burnley and then you've got a couple of days until Newcastle. And like I, I do be, think Jurgen will be looking at that and wanting to win it. Yeah, I do. I think it might be a, a boxing day grind with some uh, non-first team players out of positions, I think. Yeah. If David Carmo was right-footed, he'd be the one. <laughs> But he's not. He's left-footed, unfortunately. But he is an absolute monster in the air. 71% of his aerials. And he's he's winning four a game at that clip. That's really, really impressive. Um, And he's good on the ball. And he's solid defensively. Hmm. Anyway, 
Um, we should just throw out that none of Nat Phillips, Reese Williams or Billy Cometti are anywhere near good enough. And should the club attempt to bring them back and point to them as fixes, we should all rise in uproar because Nat Phillips can't get his game at Celtic. Reese Williams isn't even making the bench at Aberdeen and Billy Cometio is struggling, not just for game time, but for performance level in the second division in France. None of them are good enough and none of them should still be contracted to the club. Um, I suppose we should move on then and talk about this weekend's game. Liverpool take on Crystal Palace. Uh, Palace are in a poor run of form, I think it's fair to say, Carol. They have lost five of their last seven. Uh, Losing to Newcastle, not an issue. Losing to Spurs, not an issue. Losing at home to Everton, really poor. Losing away to Luton, that will be disappointing for them because that's one that Roy will have tagged as a win. The draw away to West Ham is a good result, but they were beaten last night 2-0 by Bournemouth and they were fairly comfortably beaten by all accounts. Uh, Heading into the game... We know that they've got a couple of injury issues, uh, most notably Czech Dukure out for the season with a torn Achilles, which is a huge blow for them and for him because that likely ruins any chance he has of a move next summer. Um, Raksaki is out. Rob Holding is out. Dean Henderson is out. It looks like Eberi Ezi will miss out as well, which is a big boost for us because he is such an exciting player and he's, he does well against us. And Tyreek Mitchell is a doubt, which again plays to us because he's a decent left back. So yeah, Mitchell Mitchell has done really well at Salah uh, yeah. as well a few times. Um, and and most like off the last game. And I think most had two poor games in a row. So Mitchell was probably looking at that and thinking he's not in great form. I'll I'll have a, another good go at him. But with Mitchell out. I mean, I'm not even sure who they'd play. Nathaniel Klein could slide across, maybe? Yeah, yeah, Ward and Klein at fullback, I think. Yuck, is all I can yeah. really say to that. Um, so they're, not, they're not in a good way right at this minute, Crystal Palace. Um, but even last night, they were booed off by the fans. I think mm. they were largely displeased at Hodgson for some... I mean, we all remember Hodgson's comments about games that Liverpool were amazing in despite the defeat and that we couldn't have possibly asked for anything more from them. Well, he's he's done it again, um, saying that Palace fans have been spoiled with their home form and that they shouldn't expect it to carry on and that if a team like um, Bournemouth can beat them at home, then they really shouldn't have too much expectation of getting points off the likes of Liverpool and Man City, who they play next. So that's that's a, a good boost for the squad and something for the fans to look forward to approaching Christmas as well. He is what my uncle would term a low expectation motherfucker. They've won one home game this season. Like, that's not good, Roy. Last season, they won seven of 19. That's not great. The season before, now admittedly, this was a different manager. This was, this was Vieira, but they won seven. The season before, under Roy himself. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac, and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. They won six. The season before that, I don't imagine it was much better. It wasn't. They won six. Like... What have they been spoiled with? 
five the season before that, and you look at the league finishes, 12th, 14th, 14th, 12th, 11th, and they're currently 14th. What have they been spoiled with? Actually, I think they're 15th after last night. What have they been spoiled with? Like, I understand the frustrations of Crystal Palace fans because I look at that Palace squad and I see a pretty good goalkeeping situation. Sam Johnston is decent. I know Henderson's injured, but he's a good goalkeeper. That's a pretty good def- good goalkeeping room they've got at the moment. In defence, you've got two outstanding centre-backs in Gwehi and Anderson. You've got a good left back in Tyreek Mitchell. They've been screaming for a right back for a couple of years. And yet Roy completely ignores it and makes Joel Ward his captain. And Joel Ward hasn't been Premier League caliber in about four years. Nathaniel Klein is not Premier League caliber either. In midfield, you've got Lerma, Eze, Franca, Will Hughes, Cech de Kure, Ahamada, and Jaro Riedeveld, and Jeff Schlupp. That's a pretty strong group of midfielders. In attack, you've got not a great group. You've got Elise, who's outstanding. You've got Ibue, who I think could be exciting. You've got Mateta, who's not great. You've got Ayu, who's muck and still gets in the team. Um, Eduard is inconsistent, but it's it's a good squad. And then you've got young Matthias Franke, who can play up front as well. Like It's a good squad. It's a couple of pieces away, I think, from being a really good team. They've got to be looking at, like their biggest rivals are Brighton. But they've got to be looking at Brighton and thinking, why can't that be us? Why can't we play that type of football? Why can't we get into Europe? Why can they do it? They're not a bigger club than us. They're not a richer club than us. Why can't we be like that? They've got to look at Brentford, who've only just come into the division a couple of years ago and have outperformed them in all by the first season they were in the top flight. Like, They've lost to Bournemouth last night, who a couple of weeks ago were at the bottom of the table. <clears throat> I don't understand Roy's, Roy's, uh, Roy's mindset with this. I thought it was a mistake in the summer when Palace signed him up to stay on. Whatever about bringing him back to end last season, I don't think he did any better than Vieira would have done personally. But the decision to keep him was baffling. And those comments last night, Like, that's going to create a fairly toxic atmosphere there. And I think the owners are going to have to start taking a strong look at this because the recent form has been a disgrace. You can't lose at home to Everton and Bournemouth. You can't be losing at home to them teams. When you're Crystal Palace and you have to survive in this division because your manager's not capable of anything other than survival, I just, I think they're going to have to look at this and think, is there anyone else out there? Could like, Graham Potter for me is out there. They've got a group group of players that would suit Graham Potter's style of football. They need with Decoury out. They probably need one more body in midfield, but it could be a loan. They need a striker, a more reliable source of goals, and they need a right back. But other than that, I look at that team and think that's it's pretty strong. Yeah, they should be doing far better than they are, than. They- now and like we spoke about them having what was it two seasons back now maybe even three seasons about having that real opportunity to basically have a project and a way to go forward and brought in Vieira and it looked like that's what they wanted and they were really vocal about that being what wanted like a new path uh to the you know different future than they had basically and then they just walked it all back and even if that is going to be for you know a rescue act or for half a season to make sure you stay in the league fine but have a have another plan and they haven't and they've just it's it's very very dull from a club watching perspective it's very disillusioning i think for supporters when they can see there's not really any path to getting better um when, when they continue the way that they are and then when the performances start declining as well what are you looking forward to at that point and like their home form hasn't been well has been awful like you said but Next games are against Liverpool, Brighton, and Brentford. It's not going to get much easier, like and no. you know, come unless they then improve in that little middle bit. Then for the sort of the third quarter of the season, like their home run ends against Newcastle, Man City, West Ham, and United Villa. 
Like, if you haven't turned things around, what, where are your wins coming from at home? What are you doing? If you are in any danger because it's very difficult to win away from home, where are you planning to get the points later on? That's the thing. I mean, their away form is what's keeping them afloat right now. They've won three away games at Sheffield United, at Manchester United, and at Burnley. Their away form has been better than their home form. And Roy's telling them that they're spoiled. Those people are paying hard-earned money to turn up game after game. They create one of the best atmospheres in the country. And they've been served up shit. And about a year ago, I said this was the most exciting Crystal Palace team I could remember. Me and Guy, the year before, or maybe the year before that, had gone through the list of Crystal Palace managers since the 90s. And Carl, it is an abomination. It's an insult to football fans everywhere, the shit that they've been served up for the last 30 years. And under Vieira, they were playing some nice football. You had Eze in full flow. You had Elise in full flow. Zaha was playing the best football of his career. De Kure was outstanding in midfield. Schlupp was playing well, but it was clear they needed a partner for De Kure. The centre-back pairing was good. Mitchell looked so promising. You were thinking goalkeeper, right back, one in midfield, one up front, four pieces. This is a project. You're building something, but four pieces. And quite a good academy there at Crystal Palace as well, it must be pointed out, that has a big catchment area full of incredible talent. I watched a documentary recently about South London and the talent that's come out of South London in the last 15 years. And it is incredible. And they should be building a wall around South London and saying, we're the club you come to. We're getting the, we're finding the next Sancho. We're finding the next Tammy Abraham. We're finding whatever. And they're coming here. You know, like we're going to find the next Joe Gomez or, or Ezra Conza rather than going to Charlton we're going to find them and we're going to develop them and they're going to come into our team. And then they throw it all away to bring Roy back. And I, I'm i convinced that Roy being appointed permanently is was the final straw for Wilf Zaha, who, who held out for quite a while before he signed for Galatasaray. And I think if they'd appointed, a, if they'd gone for Graham Potter, I think Wilf would have come back. But instead, he's gone. They haven't done enough in the summer. They're playing dreadful football. They're getting poor results. They've now lost De Kure for the season. Eze's out for a little while. They've just got Elise back, which is at least a plus. But I don't see much to be positive about for them. I see this as a game that we, we should go there and we should win quite comfortably. What would you be looking at as a starting eleven for Liverpool this weekend? Um, well, we're looking at Kelleher again in goal, and I don't think Trent changes. Canard obviously replaces Matip, Van Dijk stays in, and I would bring Simicast back in. Yeah, um, I mean we had a bit of a discussion about you know where the left back was going to be swapped around or changed, whether it was going to be the European game, the midweek ones, or whatever. But I think, like you said, Gomez didn't know his best night last night, so. It should be um, Costas coming back in anyway. I think Endo played well. I don't yeah, know what you so thought, I. but I thought his, yeah. His, yeah, he was obviously not elite, let's say, in terms of absolutely everything right, but I thought he was one of the few who was not pulling out of 50-50s, um, which I think Cody, Trent, Diaz, probably a couple of others as well, I saw definitely do that more than once. Um, but Endo was you know, full, fully on board and full throttle. McAllister last night went off injured, but it seems to just be like a cut. Um, I think I'd be leaving him the bed. You know, assuming he's fine to be involved, I think I would leave him top. Um, just let it be perfectly proper. Endo, well, keep his confidence up, so start him. But McAllister didn't really get hugely involved further forward against Sheffield United. So mm. combined with... Like a slight injury, I'd be inclined to leave him on the bench, use him if we need to. But I think this is all right as a game we can start Curtis Jones in and then Sobbers lie as well, obviously. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. Curtis comes in. I thought Curtis did well when he came on last night. A couple of offsides that were just lapses in concentration. But once he settled in, I, I thought he did really well. He kept the ball well. He kept it moving. He made clever decisions. Um, and frankly, Gravenberg hasn't done nearly enough to warrant starting over him again, especially after what we saw against Fulham. And even last night when he came on, he was a non-factor. Um, so Dominic, Endo, Curtis. Then the question, Carlos, what do you do up front? Because obviously we know Mo will start. Darwin came off the bench last night. I thought Jürgen got the striker rotation wrong. I thought Darwin last night was the move. And I think Cody's more suited nearly to starting as the nine against Palace, given how they defend. But I'd be tempted to go Cody and Darwin in this game with them swapping roles throughout one left wing, one through the middle. I think Diaz had another poor game last night. And I, I'd go Cody and Darwin, whichever one through the middle, whichever one left side, and just embrace the chaos. Yeah, I, I'd be fine. I think Cody was poor again as well, but mm. you know he's been in and out, so maybe his time in attack has been pretty low overall, to be honest. Um, so I've no particular problem with him starting. Um, yeah, I don't I've brought Diaz up something was... last night, Carl. Would you, given Diaz's poor form and given Cody hasn't set the world alight, would you consider Darwin through the middle and Harvey Elliott left wing, just to have? natural width in terms of he's a left footer who can create a little bit of space and whip across it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't mind that at all. I don't actually mind Elliot starting anywhere because I think he works really, really hard. And obviously he's not the biggest and obviously he's not the quickest. And do you know what? When he lines up his shots from 25, 30 yards, I'm just thinking you can't kick the ball hard enough to get to goal, mate. And it, and it very, <laughs> very rarely does get there, right? But he gives absolutely everything. Mm. And tactically, like defensively, even if he's a meter or whatever, he gets back into position. All that. I, I have no problem with Harvey Elliott starting any match. I think he's a really important player for us at the minute. Um, just yeah, by way he, of being... Um, you could even start him in midfield and try Dominic left wing either. If you know, if you didn't like the the idea of Harvey left wing. I think yeah. I, I, I'd, be, I'd really like to see what it would... I said this last night on Raw. I, I didn't mind Gomez as the left back last night if we had a left-footed left winger who was going to hold width and provide service, because my issue with this system is that the left-back has been asked to do far too much. Their centre-back, their left-back, their left wing, make that role a little bit smaller. And it takes a lot of the pressure off Virgil and a lot of the pressure off Ibu, who are both at the moment being asked to defend far too big spaces. It also then takes the pressure off the midfield because instead of just having two behind them, they've now got three. And if we had a left-footed left winger, I think it would enable us to do that because we'd have someone to give that real width. Now, everybody knows that the player I'd want is Pedro Neto, but he doesn't play for us for now. Harvey's one of the few left-footed players we have in the team. I'd really like to see what it would look like. And it could be a way into the team for him, given Diaz's poor form this season and given the injury to Diogo Jota. The other thing we could do, sort of using the same sorts of players, is just switch up, as we have said before, to more of a four. And, mm. you know, if we haven't got three players in attack who are really contributing or playing well at the minute. We know Elliot does a good job tucked in from one side. And then the other side could be Sobers, like could be Jones. They both played that role. And then you've just got Mo and Darwin through the middle. And it's a different kind of chaos. And it's a little bit of a different defensive setup. But we can drop one in very, very easily and still go to the, the you know, five alignment, basically, across in defensive phases. That shouldn't really yeah. be an issue. But maybe yeah. just in terms of getting players on the park for build-up play, for attack and final third play, who are actually sort of looking confident and informed, that might be another route as well, to be honest. Yeah, I'd be in favour of that. Go Harvey right, Dominic left, Curtis and Endo as the double pivot. And then Trent can still invert into midfield. And instead of forming a two, he can form a three with Endo and Curtis. And then that would give Trent even more freedom to get further forward. The two wide players, Dominic and, and Harvey, could hold that width. 
it would allow Costas to be a bit more reserved and stick closer to Virgil and Ibu. And then you've got Mo and Darwin through the middle. Like, at, at the moment, there are not three forward players at Liverpool who warrant a start. Jota has not been good this season. Diaz has not been good this season. And Cody has not been good this season. But we have midfielders who warrant starts, like Curtis, like Dominic, like Endo, like McAllister, like Harvey. There's more midfielders performing well this season than forward players. So, yeah, I wouldn't be at all against going to like a, a four box two or a four four two, and and still allowing Trent to move into midfield, but doing it in a slightly different way where we're going to be a bit more solid defensively as well. Right, let's get a prediction going because you have to go to work. What's your uh, prediction for this game? I'm going to go 2-0 again. Not so bad, not so bad. I'm going to go 3-1. I'm going to go 3-1. I think Michael at least might score, but I'm going to go 3-1. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. And again, we win, we go top of the league. Yeah. And that, that matters because Arsenal have to go to Villa Park where Villa have been unbelievable this season and are riding a high after last night. So very, um, very quickly, very, very quickly. Yeah. Two cleats from three games. What do you make of Cueve? I thought last night was his best performance. He didn't have a whole lot to do. Made made one good save, but his kicking was good. His sweeping was good. I thought he looked a lot more confident last night yeah, than he has done. More. Yeah, a lot more comfortable tonight, especially that the timing of when he came out of the box for one of those clearances. And then even when he's got timing, right, a couple of times, it's been like a scuff where he hasn't had the technique of the kick. Mm. But yes, yes, last night it was it was very, very good. And he came out and he made one really good claim off a set piece as well. They had some dangerous enough free kicks um, whipped in by Hammer. But he came out for one and he, he really commanded the area and claimed the ball. And it just, it seemed like it kind of lifted him and he walked a little bit taller after that. So that's promising. That is promising. And, and hopefully he takes that now into into this game. And then I think the the likelihood is that Ali is back for, for United, but then Queeving will play against West Ham. Uh, sorry, he'll play against um, Union first and then Ali comes back for United and then Queeving plays against West Ham. Ali plays against Arsenal and then it just goes back to normal. But I think Queeving will play the FA Cup, you know, and he'll still get Europa League and he'll still get EFL Cup. So, look, there's plenty of games for him uh, as long as he keeps playing well. Otherwise, I think Jürgen, if he if he throws in more stinkers, I think Jürgen might just say, you know what, I'm just going to play Ali in the League Cup and in the, the Europa League because we want to win them. Um, right, do you have anything to plug before you go? Uh, I will have a piece ahead of the weekend. I'm not sure if it'll be on our game yet or something else, but there will be something ahead of the weekend. And also for for a bit of a random crossover, uh, an interview with Jermaine Genus, um, which is not football related. So there you go. Oh, oh, I look forward to that one. I I do enjoy non football related interviews with footballers because it's just interesting to get more of an insight into who they are. So look forward to that. Uh, Thank you as always. Thank you for listening, folks, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.